Welcome to the Burn Factory Podcast with Priest and Phoenix Rivera. Listen as the boys interview the biggest names in sports and entertainment. The Burn Factory starts now. What's up, guys? Welcome back to another episode of the Burn Factory Podcast. I'm your host, Priest, joined by my co-host, my brother, the one and only Phoenix. Save us up to the camera. What's up, y'all? This is called the Burn Factory for a reason. I was given a 50% chance to survive. But through that, started this podcast because I believe every single person out there on this planet goes through a burn moment somewhere in their life. You heard Priest say a burn moment. So a burn moment is a super hard time in your life that you just have to fight and overcome. And me and Priest believe that every single person on this earth go through burn moments that truly make them who they are. But Priest, what an amazing guest we have today. We have wanted him on our podcast for a very long time. He is the greatest combat athlete of all time. He was the youngest ever to win a gold medal in the Olympics. He's in the National Wrestling Hall of Fame, and he was the fourth person ever to become a double champ in UFC history. Not only this, but he is a great man and an even better mentor to us. So please welcome Henry Cejudo. Thank you, guys. So many accolades. Bruce Buffer, move out the way. You've been <laughs> replaced, Bruce Buffer. No, yes, but thank sir. you, guys. Thank you. I appreciate it. You know, obviously, I'm here in you guys' home, here in your studio. So, uh, you know, I appreciate you guys. I, I appreciate you guys having me. Thank of course. You, thank so, you. Henry, 15 years ago today, your life changed by winning the Olympic gold medal in freestyle wrestling. Oh, are what you was serious? like? That? Are you really? Uh, we got, a, we got, a, little, got the uh, a little gift for you. You say that sometimes it's better than your birthday, so we got a little cake. God, you guys, you guys, I'm are gonna spill this. <laughs> like you know what, Era Hawani, move out <laughs> the way too, man. We, we got this. This is, you uh, can see it. This is so cool, man. I mean, it's it's 15 years. Yeah, I mean, I'm I'm even looking at the cake and I can see my pimples through it. You know, <laughs> I was so young, man, 21 years old, becoming the youngest in history at at the time in 2008. You know, uh, I think the first of all, thank you guys so much for the cake, and we're, we're gonna we're well, gonna we'll indulge in this after. Are we gonna? Are we? Yeah. yeah wait, who, wait, whose face you? is gonna go on this? Huh? <laughs> yeah. So 15 years till today is when I became the youngest in history to ever win an Olympic gold medal. And why is why is like why is this better than my birthdays? Because you know, obviously we, we we don't we don't say when we're actually born, but when you commit yourself to the dream and when you commit to something that you're more likely to get struck by lightning than to become an Olympic champion. I mean, it, it's a dream that sometimes you can even say it's far fetched, and especially the sport of wrestling. But uh, it, it's important to me because of just my upbringing. How is it that I was raised? How is it that I came up? You know, coming from. An immigrant family, you know, being one of one of seven kids raised by a single mother. And the fascinating part about all of this is uh, my mom wasn't able to attend the Olympics due to her citizenship status. So here I am going over to China, to Beijing, China, becoming the absolute best in the world. And the person who raised me wasn't there because of her citizenship status. So she wasn't able to travel. So I went out on Jay Leno. I went out on a bunch of uh, like different TV shows. They're able to kind of always give me the, how come your mom wasn't there? And I just make up all these different excuses. Oh, yeah, you know, you know, Mexicans, you know, they have about 15, you know, she has about 20 different uh, 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 grandsons and granddaughters. But uh, it's special for, it's special to me, not just because I accomplished it, uh, but what is it that I actually did to get there? You know, foregoing college, becoming a professional at the age of 17, um, and then kind of being written out by everybody, like, and nobody really believed that I could forego college and within four years go out there and actually win it. So I pretty much bet on myself. And I think the adversity that I went through to actually get there is pretty much second to none. So winning the Olympic gold was like, I felt like I stole something. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> like, is this really me? Is this really happen- happening? So it's a moment that's super surreal that, that now I'm able to inspire the world. You know, and, and I think that's that's more of what I, uh, what I take from becoming an Olympic champion. It's not the medal. It's no longer about that. I became the best when I accomplished my dream. Now it's like, how is it that I could pay it forward? For sure. What made you choose the international route and not going to college for wrestle? Um, because I, I remember this vividly. And uh, because I remember going to Russia when I was in high school. And they took me to the world's toughest tournament. It's in Siberia. It's, it's called Krasnyars. 
and they have nothing but the best wrestlers literally show up. I mean, I was watching World and Olympic champs getting put out within first and second round. And I remember I went out there and I pretty much got put out in the first round against uh, against uh, my rival, Bisa Kudakov. And I remember being so upset and so sad and so mad. All these different emotions. And I remember just sitting here. It's like, why is Russia ahead of us? You know why they're ahead of us? Because that's all they do is they do freestyle wrestling. So I wanted to change that. Because here in the United States, for those who are watching, it's like, and the, we have freestyle wrestling and Greg Roman wrestling here in the United States, but that isn't our dominant, the most popular style of wrestling. It's called folk style, you know, which is a traditional style of wrestling where they only do in the United States and the whole world, which is a very, very tough style. And I just, I just, I remember, I remember there was, a, it, and it was probably the coldest day. And I think in, uh, I think in Russia history, it was like negative 40 at that time. Yeah. Like that. Like it's a dangerous. Like if you go outside, like your eyelids will like, like if you just close your eyes for a little bit, like they will literally stay shut. But I'll never forget it because I remember being at that tournament and just watching everybody win. And I'm just like this the whole time. But at the same time, I'm pissed. I'm mad. <laughs> but I also want to watch the competition because I'm still learning. But I'm learning as I'm gritting my damn teeth. And I remember that day that I made my decision. I'm like, you know what? Like, enough is enough, dude. Like, we have to change this. And I said, it, it starts with me. So then I made the commitment of, uh, of foregoing college. Right now, I was the number one recruit in all in the whole United States. I was the pound for pound best wrestler in the United States. Like, every school wanted me. All the way from Harvard to Iowa. Was I going to get into Harvard? Probably not. But, <laughs> but Iowa, like all these, the biggest schools in the country wanted to recruit me. And I committed. I committed to something. So I kind of became a professional. I did that on purpose too. Like, you know what? I'm going to start taking money so I can stop, so I can just get people to stop trying to chase me and stop trying to sign me. Like, no, I'm committed. Like, I'm all in. Mm -hmm. Over a $3,000 check. I'm like, no, I'm doing it, man. This is this is what it's like. I'm all in. So then, Priest said, uh, it worked out. Yeah. Was it hard for you to make that decision? No, no, not really, because I was so loyal to the dream. I was so committed to the dream that to me, I, I didn't want that college life. I didn't want something that was something that everybody else had. I wanted to be different. You know, I wanted to be different. And I think that's what really, you know, allowed me to make that decision. It's like, you know, now being an entrepreneur, it's like it, it's cool to kind of manage. And you know, obviously you see your mom and dad. How is it that they run their business? But it's cool to make those decisions on your own. You have nobody to blame but you. Still to this day, do you think about winning the gold medal or do you go days without thinking about it? Or uh, you, you forget, but uh, I remember like when I first won the Olympics, because um, it was so surreal. It was like I was ranked 31st in the world, like getting into the Olympic Games. Stephen Abbas, who was a returning Olympic silver medalist, came back and he was a terror already. And this, is, this was my idol. Like this is the guy that I grew up trying to mimic and wrestle like. And here I am, I'm getting ready to wrestle my idol to actually make an Olympic team. Like we both meet up to the finals. It's one of the most epic wrestling matches in uh, USA wrestling history. And he was the silver gold medalist yeah. in the 2004 and, games. Exactly. And he won, he won a silver. So to me, it was like, even though he had won that silver, like, I'm just like, man, I want to wrestle and I want to be just like this dude. Very slick style of wrestling. And uh, I'm sure your dad has watched. I'm sure Jason has watched Stephen Abbas. <laughs> you know what I love about <laughs> Super the, slick. the match to even get qualified to be in the olympic team is at the end of the first round you walk in and nudge him with your shoulder and show him what's up and was there like a kind of a beef right there or there was because a lot of people don't know this but we, we um this is this is terrible <laughs> but you know this is the bird factory right we gotta tell it how it is on top of me actually um we used to date the same girl to say the least so the girl that he used to be boyfriends. So the girl. So, so he was, he was. It's hard to explain because she's no longer like my girlfriend. But at that time, like uh, he was dating the girl that eventually became my first girlfriend, like ever. Uh, I don't believe the whole Sean O'Malley story. You know, he's, he's <laughs> <laughs> so it, it was awkward. It was weird, and like it was weird because everybody in U.S. wrestling knew everything about everything, but it's but particularly this match. Because there is a romance behind this thing, you know. And uh, so he was my idol. What happened is, you know, at that time, kind of pretty much still his girlfriend. And then I had to, you know, and then I had to wrestle this dude to make an Olympic team. And all that kind of somewhat happened. And then I ended up going out when he was an Olympic silver medalist. And I had to go out and actually winning gold. 
oh, you know, so it's, clean it's, sweep it's, uh, <laughs> I mean, you talk about a, a hole in one, dude. I don't know, what would yeah. you call it? But that's like, uh, like there is more to that wrestling match than just, even just making an Olympic team. Hmm. Well, do you think you're more nervous in that wrestling match than you were in your Olympic gold medal match? Um, it's a good question. It's probably the same because I've always saw competition the same. Like I've always, I've, I've always respected every opponent. Like it was never really, it was never really like, uh, like obviously the Olympic Games is it was a lot more nerve wracking. Like, especially in the finals. Like I remember getting ready for the finals, and this is like my dream. And guys, when I made the Olympic team, obviously I was I was the last person to qualify to get to the Olympic Games. And the year before, I was 31st in the world, so I was ranked 31st in the world. And I was the last person to get into to qualify for the Olympics. And then on top of that, I draw the world champion in the first round, which his name was Radosov uh, Velikov from Bulgaria. And then on top of that, I had struggled to make weight. I was literally, uh, I was like 10 pounds over and I had to lose in about two hours. Oh. But this is like 10 pounds already dehydrated. So I'm able to, so I, 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 after I won the Olympics, I was able to write a book, an autobiography. And uh, I, I, I kind of able to tell like my whole story. At the age of 24, I was, an, I was already an author. But I'll never forget it because I remember um, in the, my first three matches, I was actually down. So yeah, on top of the me first being, periods. yeah. So on top of me being uh, 30, 31st in the world, not scoring a point in the last year world championships. On top of me being the underdog against Stephen Abbott trying to make the Olympic team. I, I on top of that, I'm, I'm, I'm. I was that was the last time I was in a co weight ever. Like I was literally going to retire from wrestling at the Olympics. I just I was just fed up with it of struggling to make weight, and then I draw the world champion first round, and I'm losing that wrestling match. Come back from behind, beat him. The second match I go up against, uh, uh, who is it? Uh, a, a Georgian who's who was also I was also underdog there, losing. Came back from behind and beat him, and the semifinals I beat uh, uh, the Azerbaijani. Who again I was down, came back and actually beat him. So to me, I was like, damn. And once I beat him in the semis, I remember celebrating like crazy. Like you guys wouldn't believe. Because I come from the lineage of Dan Gable, like Terry Brands. Yeah. Like if you guys know like college wrestling, it's like when you when people say Dan Gable, like, oh damn, you're under that dude. It's like a military style of of wrestling where you're either in you're either cut out for it or you're not. And I remember celebrating the semifinals, like, ah, I was like, you know, super stoked. And my coach is like, he comes from that lineage. He's like, hey, man, you haven't done anything. Like, it's all or nothing. I remember him telling me, you got one more match. You got one more. And I'm just kind of, I went from celebration to like, kind of like bowing. Like, yeah, you're right. Like, you're right. Like, it isn't, it isn't over. But I'll never forget it because I remember going back. I remember going back to the hotel that we were at. And there was like a, maybe about a four or five hour period where we, you know, before the finals. You know, and I'm just, I remember going back to my room. And I'm just like, all right, man, I want to take a nap. Like, I always do. I can take a nap during a marching band. I can take a nap at just anywhere, dude, on planes, anything. But that day in particular, dude, I couldn't, I just couldn't sleep, man. Really? I couldn't sleep because all of these memories that I had as a kid that, I, that were mesmerized in my head, I'm just like, dude, I am hours away from trying to accomplish something that I've always set out to do. First time in my life that I really felt scared. I was sitting there. I was just like, I was like in bed. I was rolling. I grabbed my, I grabbed my, uh, my coach's Bible. Kind of started reading the Bible a little bit. Like nothing was really, nothing was really kind of calming me down. And then by the time I, I mean, those five hours, those four hours, I felt like eternity. Like I'm just like down. Like it's because it's not just another wrestling match. It's like you're literally like kind of fighting for your dream. Mm -hmm. And I was a kid that, that, you know, at the training center, I would work day in and day out. Like, I was the first one or the last one to leave. Like, there was times in the wrestling room that the janitors would be in there and actually clean, and they're actually turning off the door. I'd be like, hey, guys, hey, I'm still here. Like, I'm, I'm still here. Can you guys turn the lights back on? Like, I was that type of kid, like, legit. I know a lot of people tend to say, like, oh, nobody works harder than me. But I know that, and I know that when I competed and I wrestled that nobody really worked and put the time that I did in the sport and I'm thinking of everything that kind of happened in my life and then once once the time was up my coach I remember my coach telling me hey you are you ready Henry and I'm just like yeah yeah but I'm like little did he know dude I was 
I was like, a, I was just super nervous to the point where I was scared because I never really felt that. But it was weird because once, you know, once they picked me up and then it, it probably took about a half hour to get to the actual arena. And once I got to the actual arena, like all those nerves that I had just left. Mm. Like it was a trip. Like I, I got, I just got the chills right now because of all the time that I had thought about this moment. I'm just like, dude, this is too real. This is too good to be true. This is this is like I, I felt so relaxed that I'm almost just like, dude, this isn't this isn't real now. What's wrong with me? Like almost I almost wanted to go back to being scared and nervous. Yeah, and sure enough, get to the finals against the Japanese and just beat them. A, a, a clean shutout, you know, two periods to none. You know what I'm saying? And, yeah. And I'll never forget it because I remember grabbing the American flag and, and thinking about like my family as an immigrant son, you know, one of one of seven kids, you know, raised by a single mother. A, a dad was a drug addict, in and out of jail, uh, stealing our Christmas presents when we were kids for for crack money. And I just remember grabbing that American flag for everything that we went through as a family. And I remember grabbing it and just ah. I was just like screaming to the point where I'm screaming, but I'm crying because it's an emotion that that I'll that I'll just never forget. You know what I mean? Just leaving that frustration, just leave. And it's like, hey man, everything that happened in our lives is was just was worth it. What came to this moment, you know? And it, it was it was just it was just so special that it's uh it's surreal, you know. Because as 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 a little kid, I remember watching uh, Michael Johnson. You guys are you guys are way too young for him. Oh, your dad, yeah, no, yeah, track and field. It was a hot summer day of 1996, and I remember as a as a kid at that time, we lived in a junkyard uh, inside of a trailer. It was a black and white TV with, with wooden panels on the side, and the only way to change the channel was making sure the pliers were hooked on the right way, and mm -hmm. the only way to get reception was making sure that hangers somehow something about hangers, <laughs> 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 and something you got to tap the side, and something yeah. it will turn on. But that day I watched it. That day I, wa I happened to watch the Olympics. And I'm just like, dude, Michael Johnson, just the way he shattered the 200 with his infamous gold shoes to win Olympic gold medal just changed my life and my perspective like forever. I didn't know in what sport I wanted to go to the Olympics in. I just knew that I wanted to be an Olympic champion. Mm. And when all that stuff kind of comes together and how just everything just unfolds, I'm just like, dude, like this is this is just too surreal. So I go back. So this is why, guys, this is why this is probably more precious than my actual birthday because, because of the adversity. Yeah. You know, because of not just a symbol of being an Olympic champion, but saying like, hey, you can overcome anything in life and you can do it while, you know, while representing your beautiful country. Yeah. I think the most amazing thing was just your ambition for the gold medal. And last night you kind of mentioned something funny that the reason you won the gold medal is because you feared that feeling of losing yeah and just that put amazing perspective in my life like once you fear that feeling of just losing and letting everyone down then you can really achieve tremendous things in life yeah well it's 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 that but it's more of the actual pain you know what i'm saying like the pain like you ever you guys are probably to you i don't know how many breakups you guys have been through remember that little pain that oh it hurts <laughs> it hurts it feels so good <laughs> It's somewhat like that, but it was, yeah, of course, it was a desire to become an Olympic gold medalist to do that. It, it, it was it was always a desire, but also like the motivation becomes different. Like you get to the point where you get to the highest levels, it's like, I don't want to feel that pain no more. I don't want to feel that pain of feeling second place. Like I don't. And I remember wrestling, I'm just like, and even then, like even Right before I wrestled at the Olympic Games, I, I knew that that was my last tournament. Like in my head, I'm just like, I'm gonna wrestle like it's my last day on earth. Like if you're gonna beat me, you're gonna, you're gonna you, uh, you better kill me. I don't know if you guys have seen the TikTok, if you're gonna beat me, you better kill me. Yeah, yeah, I've seen it. It was like that type of mentality that I, I had to take it there because two out of the four guys that I even wrestled at the Olympic Games had beat me in the same tournament exactly about a year apart. So not only was, not only was I uh, uh, able to become an Olympic champion, I was also uh, able to avenge two losses that I didn't like. So it was uh, the the pain of losing, if you know how to use it right, 
it'll take you to places that uh and it sucks feeling like that, but it will take you it would it will take you to a place where where it'll motivate you where you'll be like, damn, it's it's different. It's not what I thought. Yeah. I just thought it was all love and pure desire. It's like, no, guys, that's not true. When you're a high level competitor, it's like, I don't want to feel pain no more. Yeah. Like I hate it. What was that significant burn moment that made you believe that you will become a gold medal? It's medalist. It's gold medal. Um, this is just a dream, dude. Like it, it all started off with with an imagination. I, I go back to that Michael Johnson story. It was that moment. It was that moment that uh, that really sparked that 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 fire within me within me to uh, to take it to a whole nother level, man. Like it started off with inspiration, and then you start, and then and then that dream becomes slowly becomes a goal. And then that goal becomes reality and it's just like, boom, what's next? What's next to conquer? Yeah. So Henry, actually on this show, we use the acronym BURN. So each letter is a different time in your life. So starting with B, you mentioned your childhood a little bit, but take us back to your childhood, to, to your middle school days. And uh, were there some burn moments that you had to overcome? Oh, of course. Of course. I think uh, a lot of it, first of all, I like to start off with maybe poverty, like not having much as an immigrant son um like to us like to us as a family it wasn't about gangs and violence and all that other stuff like he, if you want to find it that's everywhere that's could be in this neighborhood too go go knock on somebody's door and tell them you know tell them off and you'll you'll see it yeah. it was more of just the the fact of uh you know being being uh, being you know having the nutrition to be able to you know because i grew up malnutrition as a kid like maybe, maybe we would be lucky to eat twice. You know, I remember having a growling stomach as a, as a kid. Um, going to 13 different schools, 13 different elementary schools growing up. I could probably name them all. Um, and all in a five-mile radius block. <laughs> Jeez. But it's, it's, a real, it's, it's a real story. And, these, and a lot of these people is what a lot of kids go through that. But... As you get older, you start to understand that's actually, that's actually what made you. Yeah. You know, so then, you. Yeah. So then, yeah, because every day, it almost felt like every six months it was, hey, you got a, a new, uh, you know, oh, you're a new student. And you got a, hey, class, hey. And then it's like, dude, we started all over again. Uh, like, you know what I'm saying? So it's almost like, but that also kind of built the callus. You know what I'm saying? It's almost like you almost kind of become, start to become bulletproof and you start to understand more of like the real world. You know what I'm saying? So that's a lot of what the beginning had taught me at a, such a young age. And I think me being a father now, it's like I wouldn't want my kid to go through that as much as I became successful through it because there, there is a better way. Yeah. If you didn't transfer to school so many times, do you think your life would be completely different? Yeah, I, I think so. I think so. But I, I don't think the hunger that I've maybe had, uh, like mentally and literally, <laughs> <laughs> would probably be there. But, uh, you know, sometimes you're, you know, if, if life gives you orange, you, what, what do you do? You make orange juice. You, you, you got to deal with the cards you're dealt with. And I think as a kid, we already understood because my mom was hard on us. Like my mom was like a very traditional Mexican lady that had her own, uh, that had her own trauma growing up. And she's just like, hey, this is, this is what it is. This is what it is, guys. You know, this isn't this isn't where the cat never catches Tweety. It's like no, it's like you guys screw up, and this is this is what it is. So like we almost kind of like like looking back at it now, like all right, man, like we got it, but man, you don't want to grow up too too young because you lose some of that kind of that that uh, that innocence, I guess you could say. Yeah. Do you think you grew up too young? Yeah, yeah. We I already knew that. I already knew. Yeah, I just I knew too much at. At such a young age, a hundred percent. Did you play any other sports growing up? Um, no, no. I was a kid that we, we couldn't afford a lot of things. Like I, I never grew up with animals. So we didn't have any animals. We didn't have any cats. We didn't have any dogs or anything like that. We just we could we, we did we want one maybe, but could we afford them was the biggest thing. And and that's one thing that we that we didn't. But I that's one thing that I do owe credit to is like I I was a street kid that played a lot outside. Mm. Like, you know, I was always barefooted. I was always doing something that uh, that was agile because I had a lot of energy. And uh, 
I did play soccer for, or for that was actually the first sport that we played, and it was like some drunk guy at the apartments that we lived in. He decided to like start like a soccer team because he had a kid who liked soccer who didn't really like soccer. He was trying to make him play soccer. Yeah. So this dude would drink a six pack, and he would just make us all like you know because it was a neighborhood that was full of a bunch of kids, and he was just like, "Hey, all right, man." Uh, he, I don't even think he knew how to play soccer. So we're just like, he want to start a team. And we're just like, yeah, man, that sounds good. Yeah, we'll be part of your team. So we're we're pretty good as uh we're pretty good soccer soccer players as a kid, but even that perspective kind of changed. I knew that I wanted an individual sport because it was me, and my brother, and a bunch of other little kids. We made it to the finals, man. A bunch of these, like imagine like the little rascals. Like, think of that movie. You know, we're all like just half of our you know, maybe there's a couple parents that would go to the games, maybe one. <laughs> <laughs> but we uh, we made it all the way to the finals, man. We get to this, like, dude, we, there's like a blowout. Like, this team completely that like, just beats us, dude, like 10, like 10 to 2 or 10 to 1, something stupid and crazy. And I remember I was so pissed off. I was so mad that me, both me and my brother, like, on the, we were, I was probably about 10. My brother was probably about 12. That me and him, we start kind of like blaming each other. We almost start fighting in the <laughs> in the football court. And then on top of that, so my brother was even like he was super mad at me because they ended up pulling him out of the game and they kept me in. Oh no. It's just like we're gonna lose anyways, <laughs> but it's better if we just let Henry play because they knew I was kind of like a firecracker too. But then my brother was like, Man, you wait till we get home. And then we got home and then our mom was like, Well, so what happened? She's like, Well, the the and, and this is the type of mentality that we grew up in. Yeah, but the, the, um, the coach said, because they gave us all a trophy. And it's like, but the coach said that we all won, like everybody wins. And my mom's like, it's like, your coach is wrong. He's like, there's only one winner. And she's like, let me see those trophies. And she grabs the trophies. I don't know what she did with them. But she's like, man, you guys didn't win anything. As a matter of fact, dude, you guys, she grabbed the belt. Bop. You guys embarrassing me in front of everybody, like, cause we they just started fighting, actually, like telling each other off in Spanish. <laughs> oh. So she's like, "Yeah, not only are you guys not gonna have trophies, but you guys are gonna get a whooping." And she got us both. But I understood it. You know what I'm saying? So I, I come from that, I come from that lineage. It's just like, like, all right, man, like, like you guys could be kids, but let's not get overboard. Mm -hmm. But what I did understand too from playing soccer, it's like. I knew that I belonged in wrestling. Like I knew I belonged in a contact sport on a one-on-one -on -one competition. You know, because growing up we watched, we grew up watching, uh, we grew up watching boxing. And then somehow wrestling fell into our laps. You know, as a as a kid growing up in uh, in West Phoenix, like a, and this is the beginning. So we're still in the letter B. Mm -hmm. Like a bunch of drunk Mexican Mexican guys would get together. And they used to make us fight. They used to make us fight as a sort of entertainment. You know, whether it was with gloves or without gloves, but these dudes would just get there. And, you know, it was, it was, it was, they have like those little ice cream carts that was completely illegal. And sometimes they would sell drugs out of them. But the majority of the time, those dudes were like le legit selling ice cream. And they're like, Henry, they used to call me a tigre. He's like, hey, uh, he's like, he's like, how much for this guy? And I would kind of negotiate with these dudes. All right. So how big is he? All right. All right. Let's go. Let's bring it down. But to me, I've also noticed that it was the ice cream. But it was more that spirit of competition that I already that was already engraved in me. I already had a certain added to me that I that I knew that I had to pay attention to. So then, kind of kind of start fighting in in, in in the neighborhoods where I'm starting in our apartments like that. To eventually, my brother Angel, who started wrestling first, my brother Angel and George, and I remember going to their wrestling match for the first time. And at first, when they said when they when they said wrestling i was thinking they were i was thinking like wwf mm -hmm. like oh okay dude they have that in school i was thinking like the ring and all that but when i got there it was like a a, a wrestling mat and i remember seeing these two they had like wrestlers it was at the junior high i remember seeing these two dudes come together they would actually compete and then and then they would put each other and then the person that would put the other person on, on the back you know would win and then i'm just i was a bit confused but i was like i remember being mesmerized by it Cause then the principal would come up and literally give the dude a a, a medal or give him something. I'm just like, man, and they're being rewarded for fighting. What? <laughs> so when I saw that, I just knew that that that's what I wanted to do. That I wanted to compete. 
And then uh, the rest was history. Yeah. What was that competition between like you and your brother, Angel? Like, because he was unbelievable in high school as well. 150 and 0 he was. Yeah. It was competition, but it was it was almost more of he Angel kind of played a father figure with me because he was bigger than me. So I was like his little brother, but I was also somewhat of his son, you know, because he was kind of like the more mature, more reserved. I was more of, you know, a, a little wild. Like he had to tell me maybe more than twice to do it or maybe three times. So he had so he had to play even as a brother a certain role with me. Cause remember, it was seven of us. So our, our mom made us responsible to kind of take care of each other. And if one did something wrong and the other one didn't see, then like you guys are both kind of going to get in trouble. You know, so it was somewhat like that. Did he ever want to get into combat sports after wrestling? Yeah. Um, yeah, he had aspirations. But I think with my brother, I think he had a better talent. I think, his, I think more of his love was in actually teaching. And, uh, and he did a hell of a good job with that. I mean, this year he was voted in the United States as the best wrestling coach in the country. Like you guys have any idea how hard that is? Like, there's a lot of great coaches, but when somebody says that dude this year is the best is the best wrestling coach in the country, it's it's an honor, you know. So he got the award this year over the summer. I'm just like, man, like I just you know I go back and I'm just like, man, I I love my brother. Like, there's nobody there's nobody really on this earth that I admire more than my brother Angel. And any specific reason why? Just because he was a father figure? Or? Um, no, um, it was more. It was more just because of his character, like you know, like uh, I was trying to do the right thing. You know what I'm saying? I was kind of like the angel, and the devil. Was kind of like the devil a little bit. Angel was always legit. The angel. <laughs> and I was just yeah. like, man, why can't I be more like that? Like you know, like do I have to break that window? Like do I have to? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so I, I I think of that, but I just think of. Him as just just being overall a role model, you know, being being the first, uh, you know, being the being number one in the country, being undefeated in high school. I'm just like, you know what I'm saying, and just being just you know being loved by people, yeah. you know, like I was never really loved by people like my brother Angel was. You know, you may like now you may be a fan of whatever, but even when I was a kid, I was always a bit different, you know, because I wouldn't just try to wrestle you or beat you like i would try to prove a point like it's like it's like a, i would i would go to that extent of overkill mm. like i mean some people are like dude this dude is like <laughs> this thing needs to chill <laughs> yeah, yeah exactly you know from you know zero to 100 real quick all right henry it's time to go on to you and burn unfortunate i believe that through those unfortunate burn moments the best things can come out of them just like myself whenever i was unfortunately burned in a school science experiment by my teacher that permanently left me scarred and had a 50% chance to survive and spent a week in ICU. But during those tough times, I had my dad go get my putter because I'm a competitive golfer, and I put golf balls into a glass jar, and that's when I called it my bear moment as I'm all hooked up to all the cables, IVs, IVs and like I can't even see the left side of the ball because my face is all swelled up. And in that moment... I could have e either worried about dying or I could have worried about having a best, the good time and the best time to get me to where I'm at today. Yeah. Yeah. You either swing or you swim. But yeah, um, I think adversity is a gift. I think your perspective has a lot to do with that verse and how is it that you actually view it. But I think the unfortunate part is probably not having a father. Like, you know, my, like my legit blood. I think now me, you know, having America, you guys see my little girl. It's, uh, you know, I try to be there, man. As sometimes as tough as it is, you know, it's like I wouldn't change it for the world. But then I go back and I think of their past, what's happened to them, and really understanding sometimes that's just the way life is. So I think the unfortunate part is at times not having that masculine energy, that masculine person that could teach you certain things rather than just rather than being raised by your brothers and sisters you know what i'm saying so i think that's what that's that's a you that i would consider you know for those who are watching if you, if you have kids or you pretend to have kids like be there 
mm-hmm. either because not everybody is as fortunate to have a worldview or perspective like myself. It was hard. I, I mean, I couldn't imagine not having yeah, a father yeah. figure. But looking back now, do you think that was beneficial to you? Because now you being a father, you're taking that extra push to be the best father you could be. Yeah, but sometimes you don't know what you don't know, you know? But yeah, of course. I think it, uh, I think it was able to pave the way to where I can understand life a little bit better. And it was better for him to be gone than for him to continue to keep being abusive to my mother and... And I'm being on drugs. You know, my dad eventually, unfortunately, maybe that, that could be it too, is he died a year before the Olympics, before I became Olympic gold modelist. Oh. And I was supposed to go see him like a month or two before he actually passed away. And my family didn't convince me to go. There's like an eerie feeling that I wanted to go see my, like, I wanted to finally meet this dude. I wanted to see his personality. Like, you know what I'm saying? A lot of the traits that, a lot of people would tell me that I have of him just to talk to him, dude, just, even just one time. But that's not the way life works sometimes. So that was one thing that I feel like would have been cool. But maybe things work out the way it works out because we just don't know. Yeah. So you never spoke to him? No. I think the last time I spoke to him, I was, uh, we left when I was maybe about, uh, we left South Central LA when I was about four, four and a half. And then I spoke to him like once when I was like maybe in second grade, like over the phone. It wasn't like in person. And then as I got older, it kind of started being like, hey, man, like, you know what I mean? Like, I'm getting good at this stuff. Like, I wonder what this guy is really like. You know what I mean? So I started having that curiosity. And then, you know, you get super close and then boom, he dies. Heart failure, yeah. overdose, whatever that may be. Yeah. And it was it. At 44, 45 years of age, it's just done. Did that affect your mentality going into the Olympics? Um, no, no, I don't think so. Um, I, I, it never affected any of that, but I did feel it. You know what I'm saying? Because you you still kind of you lingering with those questions, with those question marks. But even that, even that, aside from all that, like I still, I still don't judge him for that. You know. And so I'm telling you guys as as kids, and obviously you guys have parents, that you never want to, You, who are we to judge? Do you know your pat, your father's past life to be able to do that? Because if you did, maybe you understand him a little bit more. And I slowly started to kind of really understand more of his life. Like the dude was, his father left him. You know what I'm saying? He was living on the streets when he was, you know, selling gum and all that when you're in Mexico City at the age of 10. You know, stealing, doing all that to kind of survive. You know, probably things happened to him. He was probably sexually abused as a kid. And then, uh, you know what I mean? So you kind of start to kind of figure out that a lot of this trauma, thank God that it wasn't necessarily passed on to us because if he was present and he wasn't right, how much could he, could, could he have screwed us up or myself? Yeah. You know what I'm saying? So it's it it all depends how you cut it, slice it, and dice it. Yeah, I can't even imagine. Uh, yeah, that's, I mean that's that's hard to even think about. But then, uh, so you after the Olympics, you retired after the Olympics, and then you came back. So how hard was it coming back for the Olympics and back to wrestling? <sighs> yeah. So after I retired from wrestling, like I was I was done. That weight cut really did it, and then me, especially on top of winning the being being Olympic champion, like I was just like, oh, I'm definitely done now. Like I'm out. You know, you like, you win the Super Bowl, and I'm out. I'm going yeah. highs on everybody. You know, <laughs> yeah. just right top. off into the sunset. Yeah, but I was able to, you know, at that time when I won the Olympics, it was big. I was big. It was voted the second most inspiring stories of all the Olympic games. It was only second to uh it was only second to michael phelps so at that at that time mm. michael phelps won uh eight uh olympic gold medals and wow. then i think and i think after the, after that story was i think it was kobe bryant that they put at number three they started ranking like all the incredible stories mm. and then i was just happened to be second next to next next to michael phelps at that time michael phelps won eight obviously i don't get eight opportunities but uh what was that like being second Oh, it was cool. I mean, that's the only time that I could say, because it's not like I'm getting an award, but it's like, it's cool for people to acknowledge what is it that somebody kind of went to actually get there and actually win. Mm-hmm. You know, so I was on Leno, I was on George, I was on uh, 
I was on Jay Leno a couple of times. I was on Oprah. I was on uh, I was on all these. I was with Larry King Live. Like I did all these different TV shows, like the number one shows in the country, kind of just sharing sharing the story. And then I and then I produ uh, and then my book came out like two years later. Cause my they only gave like I think a few books out to a, to a few of the Olympians, Olympic champions, and then I was one of them with Michael Phelps. I think it was Sean Johnson. Then it was myself. And then I was able to just, uh, you know, start a whirlwind. So my, when I won the Olympics, my, my, my life completely changed. So I was doing public speaking at the biggest corporations in the world, you know, in front of, uh, you know, Coca-Cola. Like, they heard my story. Um, they heard me speak one time, and I remember the president was like, hey, man, you're going to come and speak to our annual company. This is the world's most recognized brand. And I'm over here speaking in front of, you know, thousands of people. Coca-Cola, TD Ameritrade, Procter & Gamble, um, I was like a global ambassador for like the biggest companies in the world. Just, I was pretty much having fun doing doing motivational, you know, speaking. And uh, the last year that I decided to come back, um, you know, pretty much coming back for the wrong reasons. But uh, so it wasn't it wasn't the same. But I, you know, it was financially it was just like the right position to kind of kind of pull me up because every every company wanted to sponsor me. And I'm just like, you know what, man? I mean, I, I got to give it a try, even though my love wasn't there no more. And uh, my ability took me so far, but it wasn't enough. Like, I made it all the way in six matches. I, I think I only had about, yeah, maybe about six matches. I made it all the way to Olympic trials semifinals. Mm. Barely losing the semifinals to get into the finals to make an Olympic team. Like, you know, after three years off, and I gave everything I had, man. I barely lost, and that dude kind of just, woof. Yeah, it was it was one of those. It was it was another Aljamain kind of type fight. <laughs> you know, it was, it was super close, but it was more. It's more meaningful because you're talking about the Olympics now. Like you're not talking about some organized. Stuff. Oh, this guy's a trash talker. Let's put him in. Oh, this guy's gonna be able to sell. Let's put him in. It's like no, at the Olympic trials, at the Olympic games, it's the best versus the best. Mm -hmm. You know, what are you really made out of? Is your strategy better than everybody else's? And that's kind of what you prove. And that's why I take more pride in becoming an Olympic champion than than two UFC bouts. Like, that's it's uncomparable. Yeah. Did you ever get too overwhelmed after winning the Olympic with all the sponsors and media? And I know. I just thought, I just felt like people at that time, I, was, I actually, as soon as I won the Olympics, I was like, man, people need to stop talking to me, dude. Because <laughs> yeah, I wasn't dude, accustomed you're to you. Yeah. you. Yeah. yeah. It's almost like, hey, hey, hey. <laughs> I was like, God, oh, dude, I was like, I think I, I think I got mad that night. Yeah. I'm like, dude, everybody stop. <laughs> like, I just wanted to compete. I just wanted to win. But then you get all this other stuff and it's just like, and then I started to understand like it comes with the territory. Yeah. Like, bro, get used to it. Have a better attitude. And I was, it's not like I was ever a punk about it, but it was something new. I was just like, bro, like you guys leave me alone. dude. Actually, I think I, I think a couple of days later, I got to fight with my brother, actually Angel. I'm like, dude, I'm not going to go over there to say hi to people like i'm just dude i'm, I'm like done. sick i'm done dude like i'm toasted <laughs> <laughs> do you think that prepped you for everything you got that you got becoming a, a ufc champion and a double champion for that yeah of course of course when you guys when when we understand that adversity is our friend and it's what makes us that's that's all it was what wrestling taught me i was able to retire from the greatest and toughest sport in the world to be able to get into mixed martial arts and have fun and actually make money, mm. you know, because that's what it is. Yeah, it looks brutal on TV, but when it comes to the level of competition, it is nowhere. It is nowhere near the Olympic Games. Like nowhere near. Think about the strength it gave you too. Not many people know this, but you did roll your ankle in the Marlon Marias fight the week of, and you had to fight through that. That's an unfortunate bear moment. Yeah. Yeah. If you if you go back if you go back to like the fighting game like that was, it's not not just with that but even when I first beat Demetrius Johnson, if you guys go back and watch that first round the first 30, 30 seconds of the fight he kicks me around right the peroneal nerve, mm -hmm. my leg starts to wobble my my it's like Conor McGregor says my foot was a balloon my foot was a balloon <laughs> yeah but I had to fight this dude for five rounds with a sprained ankle like legit a sprained ankle. But I remember, I remember, and I went back and I thought about that pain and what it feels like to lose, and I was able to, with the desire, 
I was able to kind of get get that split decision and be able to go all five rounds mm-hmm. with the Marlon Marias fight too, spraining my ankle and, uh, a week uh, on that Tuesday of fight week or Monday of fight week. You know, my my ankle was purple and blue, man. Like literally, I'll, I'll show you guys a picture here when I, you know, once we're out here, when you see, it, be like, damn. Mm-hmm. Like the coaches were trying to tell me, don't fight, dude. I'm just like, nah. I talk too much stuff. Yeah. I got I got to back it up. Was that the burn moment? Um, sure, <laughs> sure. Because <laughs> yeah. because then on top of that, like I I, I want to take it like a step forward. So it's, it's even the reason why I even start a character or a persona, because it's not just to sell, but it's also something that actually pushes me. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Because when you compete for so long, like I need something that's gonna really take me to another level where I can take my mind and everything because I don't want to be the laughing stock. Mm. You know, I want to prove it to myself. I want, and at the same time, in some sick way, I want to have fun doing it. Yeah. And I do have fun. It almost keeps you accountable too. Yeah. Yeah. So I'm able to kind of use it that way. But even that Mariah's fight to go back, like that's where I, uh, if you watch the last 36 seconds of round one, you're going to notice me going southpaw and then I throw, and then I throw the, the left hand and my, com- my shoulder completely just went out. And I felt it. And then on top of him kicking me, because I, I think uh, the night before when I strained my ankle, they happened to be in the next room. They heard a scream. Oh. And then they started kind of finding out that something had happened, but they had no idea what it was. But e- either way, their game plan was to kick me. So then on top of him kicking me, on top of, uh, um, on top of him kicking me, on top of me spraining my ankle, on top of me blowing out my shoulder in those last 36 seconds of round one, like I'm just like, all right, man. I remember getting back to that second cor- to the to the corner of round of round, yeah. A- after round one was over, and then they're asking me like, Captain Eric asked me, "Hey, man, how are your legs?" I'm like, dude, forget my legs. I'm like, I just blew out my shoulder, and then they knew that I was. That's why that's the first time that I ever taped my ankles. I, I, I'm gonna show you guys the the picture. Yeah. But it's the first time that I ever taped my ankles, and uh, and then blowing this out. So I knew that I had to go for broke, in that fight first and second round so i just came at him like all right man legit kill me or you know kill or be killed and then i was able to kind of start studying his demeanor and i started seeing him like him knowing that he can't put me away and then next you know it round three came about i already knew he was done and i did all this and and i mean it i did all this with that one arm i had no legs crazy i had my left blew out i had you know i got surgery like uh what was it like uh, five days later? They're like, once I got the MRI, they're like, hey, man, we got to get you to the emergency room. Your thing is, I couldn't raise anything. But I had two belts and I was happy with that. <laughs> yeah. It probably made it that much sweeter, too. Oh, it did. You're like, yeah, I beat you people, with one arm. Yeah, because if people really understood at that time, Marlon was like a savage, bro. Like, he was the scariest dude in that division at that time. Knocked out Aljamain Cold, knocked out uh, El Sancia, like, knocked out his last three opponents in round one. And then here I am. Going up another weight class, and then I decided to troll with the snake, with the rabbit. I started slamming things on the on the ground, you know what I mean, to kind of get into his head. Yeah, like he was out there. He really wanted to prove a lesson to me. But then once I did, I'm just like, yeah, this was. Uh, it sucks because I was out for a year, but it was it was definitely worth it. It was definitely sweet. Do you think you had more joy winning the gold medal over the double champ? Yeah, for sure. Yeah. When it went Olympic gold, man, I couldn't sleep for like two weeks because I couldn't, because my reality was like better than my dream. Yeah. This portion of the Burn Factory podcast is sponsored by Phoenix Salon Suites. Please visit Phoenix Salon Suites at P H E N I X Salons, S A L O N Suites, S U I T E S dot com to find one near you. All right, it's time to go to R. You unfortunate. There's so many unfortunate moments that we go through throughout life, but it ultimately builds you to who you are. Like for you, all those childhood times really brought you and built you to who you are. And so it's time to go to something a little more light. R. R stands for ridiculous. So all these fights, all these social media, all these appearances. Um, were there any ridiculous moments that you had uh, encountered that oh, you could I share have, with us? You guys, all my ridiculous moments are all on the internet, dude. So you guys <laughs> can watch them all. I'm known as a king of cringe for a reason. Yeah. But I don't know. I think I think they're ridiculous. That that comes to mind 
is because I'm a patron, as you guys know. It's like I, uh, you know, I'm Mexican descent, but I'm an American, and I name my I name my daughter America, and uh, something just to pay oath. And this is, this was actually in uh, Denver, Colorado. And this is a friend of mine, whose name's Frankie Sanchez. He was trying to, I guess, uh, I forget what band or somebody had pulled out. We'll say Boys Two Men. They're supposed to sing the national anthem at the Golden Boy Promotions event. In uh, in Denver in 2000, 2009, I believe. And my, I remember my friend, because he knew that I knew a lot of people. He said, like, hey, man, do you know anybody that could kind of be a backup? You know, you know anybody that, you know anybody that could see that could be a backup? And I'm just like, kind of thought about it, kind of stay silent. And I'm like, yeah, I could do it. <laughs> <laughs> So this dude's he's he's thinking like a promoter. Like if I promote the, the Olympic gold medal, is about to sing it. It seems like he thinks I can sing, but it probably sounds like a good idea. <laughs> so I'm just like, yeah, no. I says I I could do it, man. I can I can sing the national anthem, dude. Like I, I'll do it. I've always wanted to do it. It's always been a thing on my bucket list. Like I remember getting ready when you get ready to watch like a boxing event. I'm just like, no, I'm I'm gonna sing it. You know what I'm saying? No, no, like you know you know throw me the ball, throw me the hell mary. Uh, but this is how ridiculous, this is how ballsy you got to be to do something like that. Yeah. Did but the, but, the, but I, I didn't necessarily know like all the lyrics. Like obviously you do know the lyrics if you can sing it along with somebody. Mm -hmm. But then singing it along with somebody and actually memorizing that thing like by yourself is a whole nother story. So then me, so I, I probably, I want to say I probably had about, I probably about I had a couple of weeks by the time he asked me. At this time, I was in Phoenix. I'm like, no, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do this. I'm going to fly out to Denver. I'm going to go do this thing. Like, you know what I'm saying? Kind of feeling the jitters a little bit. But, th but throughout, those, throughout those two weeks, I remember like looking at uh, a bunch of uh, like bloopers of the actual oh, national no. anthem. <laughs> so I thought it was false. Like, hey, what if this happens to me? <laughs> it was a Carl Lewis. I think Carl Lewis was one of them where he messed up the national anthem. It was somebody else, but it was like, yeah. it was just like funny. Because <laughs> I was just like, man, how can you mess up something so, you know, something so patriotic? <laughs> and I was doing this as much as I was studying like the actual words and all that. I was also kind of like playing around and kind of playing with fire while, while listening to these bloopers. This is where you got to be careful too. Yeah. So then I get to Denver, you know, I'm just like, man, as the day gets closer, I'm just like, man, you're almost kind of thinking, I want to back out, dude. Like, you know what I mean? I'm like, I don't, I ain't going to do this. But it's just like, no, I went too far. My flyers are out. Like, everything's out. Like, you know, I, I got to, I got to be the one to start the show. <laughs> so you did it? Yeah, so then, oh, you know, so then I go up in the <laughs> ring. This is legit, dude. I, dude. I think there's a video out there that somebody has sent to me on Facebook because somebody actually recorded it. So then I was with a buddy of mine who was, uh, his name is Mike Wayne. He's a Chinese-American guy. And he actually even flew down. I was like, no, nah, man, how can I, you know, I'm a patriot too, man. How can I not be there for my boy when he's singing a national anthem? And I was just like, damn, I was like, God, leave, man. It, it meant a lot that he did that. Cause he legit, like, flew out. To like watch me, and his, and I remember one thing before I went up. He's like, "Hey, let me tell you something, Henry. Just in case you mess up, make sure to tell these people, like you know, start singing and ask. But if you do mess up, just say, oh, I forgot what he said. He said, he said, you know what I'm saying, or he said he told me to say something along those <laughs> lines. So that was the last thing that kind of went into my mind. Is like, and you got the rest." <laughs> 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 and just tell the crowd to keep yeah, singing. Yeah, you got yeah. the rest. Like, I was just like, but that was the last advice that I got into my head. So when I go up there, and it's different because you can sing a national anthem, but if you don't simulate the freaking lights here and the cameras here and everything's kind of just here and you, you're seeing drunk people kind of like, like everybody's talking and then the lights are hitting you and then they give you a mic. Like, if you don't simulate that damn song, like, you're going to screw up. So that's exactly what happened in my position. As I start singing, oh, say, can you see? You? you know the rest. <laughs> and then I'm just like, I'm like, I'm, I'm like, they're like, and I just got grabbed the mic. I'm just like, this is in front of thousands of people, dude. And I'm just like, uh, I think everybody knew that I was trying. So then everybody kind of started kind of singing, singing along with me. And we ended up finishing the song, and then I ended up getting like a standing ovation. And I even like apologize. Like, guys, I, I was 
I, I ain't meant to like ridicule the song, dude. I just, uh, you know, I appreciate you guys like joining me and helping me. Like it means the world, but I do apologize. And, How and long I was, is just, I was probably about 20, I was 21 years old. Yeah, I was so young. Was like right after. Yeah, it was right after the Olympics too. So you imagine that, yeah, you know, this was nice. live television, but like it wasn't like uh, so mediocre. So it was literally legit the Golden Board Promotions event. And they gave me that opportunity. I just, I just fumbled. You know, <laughs> so you want to talk about something ridiculous? There you have it. <laughs> How long did it take you to get through the whole? Oh, it took a minute because everybody was kind of like chiming in, and I started I kind of started singing along with them, and then and it turned out to kind of be oh all right, like you know, it kind of turned out to be not as bad as I thought I was gonna go, like even though that was bad. But um, yeah, there was a lot of people. A lot of people got it, and I remember my bro, my, I remember my friend afterwards came up to me and said, like, "Hey, man, I just want to let you know, you're almost kind of like crying." He was like, I just want to let you know how much I admire you for having the balls that you have. And he shook my hand. Huh. <laughs> I, I admire it, too. I, mean, I don't think I could ever say I would never, like, Especially I, in front of thousands of people like that. Oh, man. Yeah, but, you know, worst, I mean, the moral of the story is if you're going to do something, like, do it right. And I kind of, because I was so young and, like, dumb that I was kind of, I thought it was, I, I saw the humor in it. But with something like that, like, you, you don't want you don't want to do that. If do someone it. approached you again to do it, would you do it again? I might. might. Yeah, yeah, I think I would. I think I would to maybe make it up. But uh, I'd probably now get like uh, somebody that could actually teach me like some of the notes on how to really sing and then I actually get the words right. Get some vocal mm -hmm. coaches going. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Exactly. You gotta get the high notes. Maybe yeah. Priest, Priest, we'll get you out there. You <laughs> sing the national anthem. You like uh, Michael Jackson? Hey, man. Oh, yeah, I that's what he was saying. Hey. He's a big. Hey man, I can moonwalk. That's about <laughs> it. <laughs> <laughs> no, but uh, that's funny. I, yeah, I would. I can never do the national anthem. I suck at singing. Yeah. People are like, "Oh, give it a try, give it a try." My parents are like, "Give it a try," but I'm like, "Ugh, I don't think I could." Larry always Candy jokes Jason, me. Gina, yeah, he's a no, singer. No, he can right. sing. Got all faith, bro. <laughs> you no. should. What's the What's the country song you were singing? Um, Oh yeah, so we were, we were in Tennessee and we went to the Country Music Hall of Fame and there was like a a booth that you could sing in and they made me get on the mic and the headphones and I sang a a country song but it was it's it was embarrassing. Really it was good. Yeah. It wasn't it's bad. It's embarrassing. Yeah, you, yeah. Imagine that. Now imagine the lights. Everything. With thousands, thousands of people. Thousands of people. Yeah, it was a, it was a trip. But no, but I I think it's uh you know the cool thing about it is at least I did it. Maybe I didn't do it right, but I uh. I did it. Good experience. Yeah. Looks like you're seeing so, career so is not that, over. So that might be my burnt moment. <laughs> yeah. Could <laughs> like, be. Henry Cejudo goes and <laughs> makes his own song. Yeah. And you see him on record labels. <laughs> He's singing the Super Bowl national anthem one day. Man, that would be the dream, right? That'd be the dream. Taylor Swift, move out the way. I'm coming for you. <laughs> but other than that, are there any other ridiculous burnt moments that you've you went through it's gotta be slamming the snake yeah i mean obviously some of my theatrics and uh so to get back to that so some of the ridiculous stuff some of the ridiculous stuff that really saved the whole division it was when i was getting ready to fight tj dillashaw and, the, and dana white i had met up with dana white and dana white legit told me he's like hey henry we're about to you know after i beat Demetrius johnson he's like hey henry we're about to uh you know we're, we're gonna get rid of the flyweight division you know, he legit told me, like, we went to lunch. And I remember it, I was at this, this was like the maybe the first or second episode, maybe the first episode of the actual contenders. This was back in 2018. Wow. And he's like, hey, man, I just, want to, I, want, I just wanted you to hear it from me that we're getting ready to cut the flyweight division. And that's just like, I remember my, my heart, like, kind of, like, sinking. But at the same time, I was like, man, I'm kind of tired of cutting weight. Because I was struggling, dude. You know, and then from... Doing cutting weight your whole damn life, you're like, man, I just, but then I just thought about everybody who was, who, you know, who's not big enough for the, for the Bantamweight division. Cause even though I'm short, like I'm, I'm a girthy, you know what I mean? Like I, I, I got me, like, you know what I'm saying? And you, a lot of these guys, I had a lot of training partners uh, that were flyweights. And I kind of just thought of them, you know what I'm saying? I'm just like, so then when he told me that, and I talked to my my manager Ali, he's like, you know, by law he he can't do that unless unless you relinquish the belt. Mm -hmm. So at this time, T.J. Dillashaw 
wanted to come down because that was the original plan. Let's get TJ Dillashaw versus Demetrius Johnson at 125 pounds. We want we want TJ Dillashaw to beat him. So then, so then, but I, I also kind of wanted the opportunity when I fought. I was like, no, I want to go up because Demetrius Johnson was supposed to go up. Like it was kind of like that trick, which but, but but then again, I thought about. It, I'm just like, you know what? Let's bring TJ Dillashaw down then. Like you know what I'm saying? Like yeah, all right. As of right now, he is the A side. I'll abide. I said because I know I know that I'm gonna beat him at 125 pounds, and after I beat him at 125 pounds, we're gonna fight for his belt. So I'm gonna get a chance to double dip. Mm. You know, so that's why I saw. It. So then I told Dana why I told Ali to tell Dana why, and everybody was like, no, Henry wants Henry wants TJ Dillashaw to come down, and he'll challenge him. And everybody agreed because they're they're gonna give me a shot at 100, at 135 pounds if I relinquish the belt. Because as soon as I relinquish the belt, they're gonna dissolve the whole division. And this is th this is things that people don't know. So I took it upon myself to create a character known as a King of Cringe to be able to bring attention to the flyweight division. Because I was never like that. Go back and look at all my other stuff. Go back and look at me uh, pre-Demetrius -Demi Johnson. And then go look at me, you know, post-Demetrius Johnson. How much of it actually changed. So then I'm just thinking, I remember talking to Captain Eric. I'm just like, Eric... Uh, you know, we got to we gotta do something to be different because 55 people's jobs are about to vanish. Like, you know what I'm saying? Mine and being included. So then I'm just like, uh, so then I just started kind of like thinking. So then I'm almost like, all right, man, this is what I'm going to do at the press conference. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to show up with the, with, the gold, uh, with the gold jacket, with snake pants, and I'm going to put my gold medal on. And then right before we had the face off, in I'm the all, uh, yeah, in the hat, yeah. And then right before we had the face off, I am going to pull a snake out because TJ is known as a snake, and I'm going to whip it down the floor and then <laughs> just boom, see how much attention we could actually get. And then everything that I eventually ended up doing ended up going viral, dude. You know, it was on ESPN first take. And I'm just yeah. like, and I'm just like, damn, really for that? You know, it, it even went far beyond than what I really thought. And then people started saying, like, man, this dude is cringe, 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 cringe. And then I kind of started laughing. I started reading some of the comments. And I'm like, <laughs> I got that humor where I think a lot of the stuff that these people say is just, like, hilarious. Like, I don't take that stuff personal. And I'm just like, man, that's that's pretty good. Like, that's, like, I, 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 I get why McGregor and a lot of you guys have done what they've done to sell tickets. And then, uh, sure enough, I go out there. You know, whipped the snake out, and the fighting TJ ended up knocking him, knocking him out in 32 seconds. And then it still wasn't kind of like patch. And I started kind of getting on the mic. If you go watch, if you go back and actually watch my post fight interview with TJ, I'm just like, hey guys, I hope this this was for the flyweight division. I hope this was enough to to save the fly division, the flyweight division. I said this was beyond me. This was for the flyweight division. So Dana White. You know, the, the, fly, the, the flyweight division is staying. But it still wasn't, as, like, even after being TJ Dillash, like, it was still on eggshells. Like, you know what I'm saying? Like, it was still, like, unless I relinquished the belt, then the, the whole division would, would have been gone. Yeah. And Dana would tell you this. Like, they'll be like, hey, this kid legit saved the division. So then after I beat Marlon Marias, once I beat him, he's just like, man, this kid is special. You know, and that's when I started coming out with the crown and then boom, we're just <laughs> kind of taking the king of cringe to a whole nother level. Yeah. So that's, kind of, that's kind of how it started. And then after I beat Marlon Marais, Dana White said, you know, he said, hey, uh, this kid's something special. The flight, the flyweight division is staying. Did you feel an, uh, an excess amount of pressure going into the TJ fight? Fighting um, for the division? Or was it just another fight? It was just another fight. But yeah, I think if anything, it, it, it was a pressure that really kind of Kick, like pushed me to get the job done. Mm -hmm. So it wasn't like a pressure, like oh my god, everybody's looking at me. I don't want anybody down. I'm like no, it was more like no. There's a lot of there's a lot at stake here. Yeah, and I'm gonna make it extra special. Well, think about all the other lives you've changed. I mean, Davidson Figueredo, Brandon Moreno, Pantoja. Like these guys would be non-existent if it wasn't for you. They can give me ten percent of their purse every time they fight. <laughs> How about that? Maybe Ain't they that should. right, Jason. Come on. <laughs> Maybe <laughs> they should. Maybe they should. Uh, no, yeah, you paved the way for them, and, and they should thank you for and, that. And they, and they still hate me. What's going yeah, on? Yeah, they still hate I, me. I give them their job, and they still hate me. I don't get it. Yeah, <laughs> crazy <laughs> business, my man. It's a it's a crazy business. You got it. Yeah, tell us that story about uh, you and Brandon. What's what's going on there? 
Yeah. Um. Now we are we are we are we going to the letter N or what's going on? Okay. Yeah, we can move in the end. We'll move in. So an end is two parts. It's now and next. So starting with now, like what are some burn moments you're going through right now? And then move into next. What are some burn moments you're going through next? Um, You know, we can go back and actually talk about Brennan. Um, I just figured the end would somehow be, you know, somehow it would connect to Brennan. But, uh, it does. It kind of does. Yeah, you think so? Like, how would Maybe. I how would I connect it? Tell me. <laughs> I don't know. It's a relevant thing right now. Yeah. So, like, what what do you what is going on in your life right now? Like, what are some burn moments inside fighting, outside fighting? What are some things that you're going through right this moment? Yeah, well, I think I think there's a lot at I think I think right now, obviously, this Saturday is going to say a lot about what is it that's going to happen. You know, I, I'm in I'm ranked now number three um, in the world, so I just think the rankings if. I think Aljamain wins. It's gonna be, uh, it's gonna allow me to maybe be in that title picture once again, which it should. And then, uh, but going back to the whole Brandon uh, story is like, yeah, dude, we're boys, man. Like uh, Brandon and myself, like he was my head. Uh, he was pretty much my head, uh, my main training partner for Juice Formiga, and then when I first fought Demetrius Johnson. And then, uh, you know, we're cl- close as could be. You know what I'm saying? He would actually stay with me. Not just him, but I was, you know, I'm that type of guy that where I feel like if somebody really needs something, like, I'll do it. You know, like, not just him staying with me, but actually his family too, like his kids. Cause I know how important it is for him to to have them. So, like, just everybody pretty much staying at my house. Um, And uh, we had a, we had a good bond, man. I was able to, I was I was able to be part of, you know, obviously he helped me for, for Juice for me. He helped me for Demetrius Johnson. And then I was able to get him on the Ultimate Fighter, and that was part of one of my things that I wanted. You know, if I was going to be coached, it's like, you know, get this, get this Mexican kid who's here. At least we put in the word. You know, I'm not saying that Brandon didn't deserve it, but when you put in the word, you're about to be the coach. It's like, all right, man, you know, we'll give you that, that size. So we ended up, you know, helping Brandon in the situation of actually getting in. You know, because he was the champion at WFF, and obviously he was my training partner. So I make sure that at that time. That my agent, which wasn't Ali, it was somebody else, Bill McFarland, that he knew that I was going to become coach with Joe Benavides to be the ultimate fighter coaches. But this is the only thing that I asked for. I didn't ask for more money. I didn't ask for any of that stuff. I didn't have to pull at that time uh, either way. So then I get him on there. You know, we get on the show. You know, it's like everything's fine and dandy. And then... Uh, at that time, the Ultimate Fighter, they at that season, they were picking like 17 or 16 of the best guys in the world. So they were picking guys from South Africa, from Australia, from Fiji, uh, not Fiji, uh, New Zealand, Kai Kara, France, Pantoja from Brazil, uh, Brandon from Mexico. I mean, they, they, like to me, like the toughest, serious, the toughest Ultimate Fighter of all time is look at Tough 24. So you can see a lot of guys who now are former champs that came out of that season. And, uh, you know, like, so then, so then, you know, I get them on the show. We're, we're both there. Me and, me and Benavides are coaches. And what, from what they told us, the rules and how is it that everything was kind of, kind of be selected is it was time to pick the teams. And they said, uh, nobody knew the rankings or anything like that, but they said, Hey, if you pick this guy, it's going to be on ranking. The other guy that it's, it's all going to go by seedings. So if you pick number one. Number 16, the last seed goes into the opposite team. If you pick number th- mm, two, okay. number 15 goes to the opposite team. You know, and me knowing Brandon and knowing that he was the last person to pretty much get in when we spoke to the team, they're like, Henry, because we don't want to lose a top pick and know he's your boy. He's like, pick Brandon second so we don't lose because we know how good he is, but pick him second so we don't lose or we don't get another guy that's more likely more likely going to win or lose. You know what I'm saying? So what I did is I ended up, so then the so then the picking came in, and then I think Joe had the first pick, and he picked, uh, I want to say he picked Tim Elliott. And once he picked Tim Elliott, like, uh, 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 which I think Tim Elliott was number two or three, I think it was number 13 that came into our team. So then it was my turn to pick. And then I ended up picking again. I, I know, and I know a lot of this stuff. I know the scene. I know anything, but I just knew that as a team, everybody wanted me 
So it was a business decision to pick Brandon second. But as soon as it, so I ended up picking Pantoja number one. And when Pantoja happens to be the number one seed, the number 16 happened to be Brandon. And then Brandon went to the opposite team. Like, you know what I'm saying? So this is how it worked. So I'm just like, damn. So right there, like that whole show, like I was already like, I was already kind of upset with myself because... And, and even with the team, but at the same time, I was being a team player because I understood what we were trying to do. You know what I'm saying? Because we did help Brandon to get into tough 24. So guess what? Because he was t because he was the last seat to probably get in through us. That we're gonna we're gonna pick him at 16. We're gonna put him last. So that's kind of how it worked so they out. They got you. In some ways, but I th I think destiny works out for his best. So then that's what happened. So then I was just kind of like, but, but then three days later, because he was, because it was one in the 16th seed, Brandon and Pantoja fought like two days later or three days later, maybe two days later. So they're telling everybody, hey, everybody, you guys be on weight because more likely you're going to fight. Like if you're the number one seed, 16th seed, like you're fighting right away. So everybody was already kind of down on weight. So two days later, like these dudes officially fought. So then when, when Brandon and Pantoja fought, like I was, I was like, hey guys, I'm out. Dude. I'm not going to coach this guy. Like I'm not going to coach Pantoja. So I just kind of removed myself from the corner. And then, uh, you know, that's when uh, Pantoja and Brandon fought and then Pantoja ended up beating him. You know, and I went uh, and I went up to Brandon. I just I apologized. I said, like, hey man, that wasn't my intention. You know, that wasn't the way it's supposed to go. And then that's just, the, that's just what it was. So then for like six weeks, which is the ultimate fighter, I kind of lived with that guilt of feeling like a backstabber in some sense. But I hope you guys also do understand the scenario too yeah. of why the team was thinking about doing it that way. And then the whole show happened, like the whole like the whole show uh, happened and we, uh, you know, and he, he got super close to Benavides. And I understand, man. If somebody takes care of you, I get it, dude. And me and him were supposed to fight. And at that time, like Benavides was being a dick to me. And this is before the King of Crazy. Like, I was just trying to be like, I wasn't trying to do things in, in front of camera for like attention. Like, at, at that time, I was still, I, I still wanted to be like that all American boy of, you know, non violence, yeah. not really understanding the game like how I understand it now. I know everything that's based on sales. And then uh, I remember the show was over pretty much. And I remember going up to Brandon and I'm just like, and, he, and, and, I, remember, and I remember going up to him and we we're just talking to him. And I was like, and he told me, he's like, hey, man, I just want to let you know that, you know, I became really close to Joe Benavides, man. So because I came super close to him, like, I don't want to help you against him, but I'm not going to be on, I'm not going to be, I don't want to be in his camp nor your camp. Like, you guys are going to have to kind of deal with the stuff on your own. And I shook hands with them. I was like, dude, I understand, dude. After what it is that, that happened and you build a relationship, I get it. I get it. And uh, you know what I mean? Like, it was already like a strain. I shook his hand. Like, it was still kind of a little weird. But then, like, our our fight officially starts to get closer. And the next you know it, I get a, you know, the as the fight gets closer. And, and like, Brandon gave me his word that he wasn't going to go, like, he wasn't going to train on either side. Next you know, this dude's training with Joe Benavides, man. For his camp? For his camp. Like, pretty much to beat me. So I'm just, like, kind of, like, thrown off. I'm just like, dude, you just gave me your word. Like, I hope I hope you guys understood the comp the the situation. What is it that happened that you were chosen, that we were planning on choosing you number two? Because we, we, we didn't want to get another low seat because the, the key of the tournament was to try to get our fighters to eventually start winning. Like, we, we don't, we don't want to shut up. So if you give... If you pick somebody that people don't know, it's like like Joe never knew who Brandon Moreno was. So I don't get why is it that he would like, nobody was going to pick him. You, you see what I'm saying? Yeah. So then he did that. And then I was just like, once once he did that, I was just like, kind of like my gloves would come off. I was a bit hurt. I was a bit hurt because I was just like, man, like, like you knew the situation, bro. Like, your family stayed with me. Like, I had you here. Like, I, I did, you know what I mean? Like, I tried to be the best friend that I could. And I, I listened to the team at that point. You gave me your word, like, all that other stuff. And yeah, sure enough, I ended up fine. I ended up losing, like, a sp split decision loss. That you didn't lose. And that's probably one that I can say, I don't know how I lost. You know what I'm saying? And sure enough, after the loss, like, Brandon comes up to me and he's just like, hey, man, you won that fight. And I'm kind of just like, I kind of, I was kind of like, man, like, like get out of here, dude. Like, you know what I'm saying? Because I knew I kind of won, but I don't know how 
when the same judge, Derek Cleary, scored four rounds to zero against me in that fight. And it was a split decision loss. Like, think about it. It's the same guy that scored that fifth round to Aljamain Sterling. So think about how oh. everything kind of correlates. <laughs> yeah, it's a oh, trip. Oh, man. So, so, then, so then after that, I'm just like, I was still kind of like cool, man, because I still had a lot of love for him. I'm just like, you know, I, I get it, man. Maybe I do deserve it because I got it that way. I'm just like, nah, man, that's like, that's like a kick in the balls a little bit. Like, I hope you get into the show. You gave me where that you want to go over. Then you went over there without even telling me. Yeah. So then his coach, and he, and he never apologized to me. Like, his wife sent me a message, with, which I still think I have now. Like, because she felt bad. She's like, hey, I just want to let you know. This was after the Benavides fight. Like, I just want to let you know that... uh that I'm sorry, man, that 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 the way things kind of happened. His coach, too, our, our Vizu at that time, whoever did it, he did the same thing. They apologized, but there was nothing I could do now, man. Yeah. So then I ended up, uh, so then I, I ended up, um, the UFC, they were trying to, like, make a fight between both of us. And we're at the UFCP, and I saw him, and I'm just like, hey, man, let's fight, dude. Like, this is the only way to do it now, man. How long like, ago was this? This was, like, in 20, 2016. 2016. Right after my loss. I'm like, let's uh, let's scrap, dude. Like, let's fight. Because as, as, like, I, I, saw, I always saw him, like, as a little brother. And I'm like, as a big brother, you kind of want to teach him or show him what is it that, you know what I'm saying? Like, nah, man. Like, like you took the gloves. Like, the gloves are off. But then I told him, I told him in Spanish, let's fight. And he just told me something in, in English. I'm sorry, in Spanish. He was like... I don't, I don't want to fight you, Henry, because te tengo mucho cariño. Like, I don't want to tell you because you're too much. I have too much love for you. Translation. So then when he told me that, I just kind of just, just left it. Mm -hmm. Like, I just, I never picked on him or anything like that. I was just like, whatever. Like, you know what I'm saying? Like, that's just a, a distance memory for me. Yeah. So, so then that, so then that whole thing happened. It kind of always stuck with me. So then when he fought against uh, Davis and Figueredo, so I always fast forward everything. And he ended up becoming champion. He ended up becoming champion. Uh, and, and I was there. I was there. For, I was front row. I was like, yeah. I always knew this dude had it. It was special. Like, I always knew it. Even in the rest, even in the, when we would spar and all that, like, it was always super close. Or not close, but like, I would get the better of him. But I always knew that the potential of him getting better was like, he was close, good. He yeah. was good. Like, he may look like McLovin, the Mexican McLovin. <laughs> but the dude could actually fight. Yeah. So it's not like he just came out of nowhere. No, that dude's been fighting longer than I have, maybe double what I have. And uh, and then when I and then I happened to just run into Davison Figueroa at a restaurant, and then I actually brought up the idea. I was like, Davison, I can help you win, dude. I said, if you trust me, dude, I can help you get your belt back. I says, I know how to beat this dude. You know, so you know what I'm saying. And he looked at me, and he and I just I just told him a little bit. I'm like, Davison, you don't. You weren't ready for war today. Like, you just weren't there. But I'm like, but I could help you. I can help you uh, game plan this time. You know, I had, I was working with uh, with Wei Lee, with Jones, with, you know, Demetri, some of the best guys in the world. And I'm just like, just just come over, come over, dude. Come over for three months. Sure enough, he took me on his word. And then we ended up, uh, we ended up, you know, I, I helped Davis in that whole camp. We ended up bringing back that, that world title oh. game. Like he stayed disciplined, like he understood the game plan, and we ended up uh, we ended up beating them, mm. and that's kind of what uh, that's kind of how it happened. Yeah. So flipping things back on you, uh, next what what's next for you? Obviously tonight is is a big fight, but uh, what is what is coming in your future? What are some burn moments that uh, you see coming up? <sighs> Getting this title back, man. That's uh. That's what I want more than anything. Like right now, it's like I, I used to try to chase Volkanovski because I know how good he is. But right now, it's not about that. Right now, it's about really getting what uh, what I'm set out to do. So I feel that pain once again. Remember that pain that I was talking about? Yeah. It's like, I, I don't want to feel that pain no more. Do you want to rerun it with Aljo? Or I would like to rerun it with Aljo, but it seems like Aljo is saying, ah, I'm too big. No, like 45. He's not going to do anything at 45, but... If I had my choice, I'd, if I had my choice, I'd love to get Aljo again because I know the mistakes that I made and, and kind of to be better for that fight and to actually win and really make a statement. But uh, I would, uh, if it's not Aljo, I would want his, uh, his boyfriend, Marab. You know, do I, do I need another belt? No, but, no, but I need it. 
Yeah, you need it. You need that win back. No more, yeah. no more feeling that pain of losing. No more, no dude, more, no more. No, no more. more. But all right, Henry, will you just spelt burning your life? Thank you so much for coming on the show. Um, tell Come the viewers, on, guys, <laughs> give it a call. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, tell Thank the viewers you. where they can find you, Instagram, social media. You guys all can that. find me everywhere. You guys can find me at the club. <laughs> you guys can find me. No, you guys can find me at Instagram, Twitter. You guys just Google Henry Suhu. You guys will see everything. So you guys make sure to subscribe to my damn YouTube channel too. You heard the man. Go subscribe to his YouTube channel. Also, go give him some love on social media. And as a gift for coming on the podcast, Henry, you will be getting the Black Label Edition Burn Factory hoodie. Ooh. I can't reach it. Uh, there I you got, go. Only uh, guests reach. get that. So oh, black yeah, is, is reserved for the guest. You got the t shirt. What if I put it on the black there? market, dude? <laughs> <laughs> you probably sell for some good money. Good yeah. cheddar. That's nice. Ooh. Thank you, guys. Of yeah. course. And like always, please visit my foundation as well, the priestjamesfoundation.org. Again, the priestjamesfoundation.org to understand why this is called the Burn Factory. And we'll see you guys for the next episode. Peace. All right, guys. We're here with Henry Cejudo, who just spelled burn in his life. And he is now the Burn Factory Podcast Champion. C4. C4, C4 baby. What's up? What's up? Let's go. What's Get your burnt moment? Let's go. What's your burnt moment? Come on the show. Come get this belt. <laughs>